like to give people an understanding on how uh, the class came about. And I think you understanding uh, how God led uh, me here to do this uh, gives you a better understanding of where the class is going to. Uh, one of my main ministry roles here is uh, I get to teach mostly on Wednesday nights. Uh, I, I, to my count, this is either my eighth or ninth class at Great Fellowship. Uh, I, my last class was in the spring. I finished at the end of May. And uh, when, I was, when I was getting toward the end of that class, uh, I felt that we needed a summer class. Usually, if you're familiar with Great Fellowship and how we operate around here, uh, usually you kind of think you take a little vacation, take a little break on, on summer, you know, some small groups stop meeting. Uh, there's usually no kids programs in the summer. And you know, give people a break, keep them all traveling. But I really felt that uh, God uh, wanted me to teach a class. Now, I, I, I just got done teaching the May class, and, and the church needed an answer from me uh, pretty much the day after I taught my class in May. So I had to spend, you know, the, so I taught a class, probably one of the greatest classes I ever had here at Grace Fellowship. Taught the class, and the next morning I had to be in prayer for the next class. Well, I, I thought God said, yes, we need to class. Well, then the church goes, well, we need a topic because, you know, there's so many people who operate in the ministries here, a lot behind the scenes with facilities and promotions. They need to know, right, what I'm teaching. So, kind of, kind of wrestle through some ideas, wrestle through uh, what, to, what direction to go into, and then uh, the, the, the phrase uh, slowing down came to mind. That in the midst of this society that we're in and how busy we are, um, we all want to slow down, right, and connect with God. That is why we're on this earth to connect with God, and the ability to slow down and connect with God is something that for our culture can be very foreign to us. Well, so I got the title, I got the class, and I was like, well, you know what, is anybody going to come to the class? And, and so, was, uh, so, so the human side of me uh, was saying, you know, yeah, I don't think so, but then I, I felt the Holy Spirit ask me to pray, 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 pray for a lot of people to come. So then I, I gave the church my class space, my class, and they gave me one of the small classrooms. I said, no, I need a bigger room. And, and, and the, the, the spirit inside was saying, pray for a bigger room, ask for a bigger room. So in faith, I, I, I'm looking for a bigger room. So it would be either the youth room or the, the, the gallery area. And, and you know, the, the day student work that I had to coordinate with children's ministry who uses this room. I had to coordinate with youth ministry who uses this room and other men that use this room. And finally, came the came to work. And I, and I was praying that God would allow this place to be available and a lot of people to come. And based by your attendance, and I know there's a few people who aren't going to be here who will be over next week, just by your attendance, I can understand that uh, there is a great need in there. So let me tell you about myself. Uh, my name is Tim Kong. Uh, some of you may see me around, some of you may not know me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I've become a Grace Fellowship for about four years or so. Uh, I served in a variety of capacities. I've helped out with uh, uh, other teachers for the two-year-olds. I've done small groups. I've done small group leadership. Uh, I've done event planning. Uh, I've worked with discipleship uh, office here. Uh, but my main thing now is I teach. I have the program of teaching. Uh, I already have a class on for September. Later, I have to get on for the next few I want to know what that class is about. And one of my main ministers are to teach. I have a wife, her name is Belinda. We've been married uh, almost 11 years, and she serves here as well. She serves on Wednesday nights in Awana, and she teaches uh, the kindergarten class uh, at the 11 o'clock service here as well. We have two girls, uh, Eliana, who is six, and Elizabeth, who's four, who, uh, I want to tell you the story. You know, I had, I took, uh, I had meetings at church all morning, so I took the day off from work. And I was going to plan for this tonight. Tonight, in between, I wanted to take my two girls out to uh, uh, to do some fun. It was raining, so we went to the mall. Well, around 3:30, my youngest one ran down the slide in front of L.O.B. in that little mall area, and she hit her mouth on the bench, popped the tooth out, and was gushing blood. 
So, so here I am today with, with, with my two girls, and my 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 own. I'm, I'm carrying through the mall, going through security, and uh, so I, I call my wife. Like, what should we do? What should we do? And it's like find a dentist, and I'm a little bit of a dentist, so we're like, all right. So I called up some dentists, the PI like, didn't make them, and like drop your finger. My wife's meeting me there, and uh, she's fine. So it, it, it should be a little, uh, it'll be a little bloody for the next couple days, but she should be fine. And uh, meeting her on time, but that, those are my two kids. Very active, very full of life. Um, we live in Rensselaer, here in New York. We live, in, we live in the capital region for about six years now. And uh, prior to coming to Grace Fellowship, I served as a senior pastor uh, locally in this area, and uh, we love the capital region. We uh, actually moved here from downstate uh, New York because. We thought uh, God wanted us here, and we thought that God was moving in the capital region. True story. We didn't have a job. We moved up here in faith, and uh, God took care of the rest. So that's a little bit about me. And uh, what I want to do is, uh, if, if, if your workbook uh, has many different parts. If you uh, have a chance, if you can read sometimes when you, when you want to read the introduction and the preface, that's sort of about uh, why uh, we do what we do. Table of contents will give you the subject what we're talking about over the next six weeks. Uh, I'd like to be totally up front of what we're doing, and you can see uh, uh, where we're going. And then uh, I'd like to give my references to the back of sort of how, uh, how I study and how I came about this class. Uh, I'd like to, uh, for those of you who know me, when I, when I do class, I'd like to sort of uh, pray to God, ask Him where, where we should go. Uh, I don't like using curriculums, nothing against curriculums, but I really feel that if I am going to teach to this audience in this period of time, I have to hear from God on what to do. Um, just to give you a little information about me, up there is my cell phone number, you can call or text, uh, my email address, and my website. The website is important because if you miss a class, uh, I have it all, the audio and the video on the website. So t tonight, uh, I will put the audio and video, so if you miss a class, uh, it is up there for you to um, go to. I also have, you know, I have a lot of people who uh, like to go back to the video and to to watch it and to kind of, kind of pick up things that they may have left off. Um, when you come into class, you can try to bring a Bible, whether that's a physical Bible, whether that's, whether that's a phone or a tablet. Bring some sort of thing we do with the Bible. Bring a pen if you, if, if you can. If not, there's a couple boxes of pens out there. But I've already bring your own pen. And um, also, bring the workbook, of course. I know, I know that some of you may come straight from work and you have family obligations or work obligations. If you want to bring uh, food, that's fine. I see some of you bring drinks, that's fine. If you need to bring your dinner in here, coming from work, that's perfectly fine. That, I don't want anything to prevent you from getting here. If you need to, to come in and do what you should do what you need to do, go ahead and do what you need to do. Any questions before I move on? Alright, so let me, what, what I want, I like to set some sort of, I don't want to call them ground rules, but sort of uh, class values that I value our time together. And, and I think that's going to be a good launching point before we kick off uh, our work. So here's some of the class, oh, there you go. All right, so here it is. I'm trying to get, I was trying to get some uh, visual illustrations on sort of life, right? So while we're doing this class, so you ever feel like your cell phone is 100 percent full, you ever feel your life is like that, or maybe uh, your life says system overload, like the computer does, or maybe a better picture of your life is this. Right? It says things going out of control, things going everywhere, don't know where to turn. My goal in this class is for all of you to have a better way to connect with God. Right? And, and, and after the six weeks, if you have found a better way and a better medium and a better avenue to connect with God and, and a better connection with God, then we accomplish our goal. But I also believe. Right? That God moves in ways more than we can imagine, more than we can expect. And I believe that God is going to move in more ways, more powerful ways than I or you can expect, because that's what He always does. So let me go through 
class values. These, 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 uh, these are not your notes, but these are values that, we, that, that I want to make sure that we set straight here, that we sort of lay down to make, help us understand. Um, if in your workbook, I have a lot of blank pages uh, there, so uh, if I go veer off into another direction, there are pages that you can take. So here's the class values. Number one. Number one, a collective journey. Value number one for our class is collective journey. Here's what I mean. We are all on a six week journey together. You, me, I'm in this with you together. Okay? What I like to teach, I like to make an emphasis that it's a, it's a spiritual learning journey together. Okay? I'm here for you. That's why you my cell phone number, my email address. Right? I, I, I am, other people in this class are here for you. I, I find that through a lot of the classes I teach, authentic relationships are being formed in the class. So number one, the value that we have is a collective journey. Right? You're not here alone. You're not, you're not meant to walk this way. You're, you're meant to do this in community. And for the six weeks, we're in a little smaller community here. Number two, structural flexibility. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I have this weird balance uh, that God has given me. With, I'm very structured, which is why you have your notes already set aside for you and, and you have a workbook. But I also believe in the leading of the Holy Spirit. So if you give me grace sometimes, there's sometimes that we're going to need to veer off because I feel God leading us in a different direction. But in the structure of the workbook, there's a lot of flexibility in that. So. You need to give me grace if I skip a section for time reasons, or give me grace if I add a section that I feel we need to add. It. Now, obviously, I, I you know I I, I see God and I prepare this. You know, I spend probably a month or six weeks preparing for this. But sometimes I don't know uh, how God may lead during the week. And also, the reason I have you, uh, if there's any more green sheets, you can fill one up in the back. But well, the reason I feel have you fill the green sheets is. I need to know where your heart is. I need to know where your soul is, and there are times where I have to modify the class based on the collective feelings of the people in the class. So number one, collective journey. Number two, structural flexibility. Number three, a resilience to being present. Okay? I, I understand, I'm not counting uh, vacations already planned, or holidays already planned, or events already planned. I'm talking about the days that you had a long day at work and you used to like crash in the couch that I want you to push to be here. Or the day that it's so nice outside you just rather just be on the lake, push to be here. Or you just feel like you don't want anyone to talk to you because you just want to be alone, push to be here. Right? I'm not, I'm not talking about scarification, I'm not talking about you being in the hospital bed. I'm talking about the times where you have a choice to make, either being here or not being here. But I want you to have a value is the resilience to being present. Fourth, openness, safety, and confidentiality. You see, because we're on a collective journey, we're a family. Right? And what happens in this room stays in this room. Right? It, it, it may be a little bit harder uh, on a big scale, which is why I'll have you break up in your tables at the but I want a value for us to be that there's even open. Right? A, a place where you can be born. A safe place. No condemnation. No judging. Right? All love. That's what, that's what we're here for. Just a place where, where you can feel the love of Christ as you, when you walk in and everybody else exhibits that love of Christ. Last one. A sense of aesthetics. Expect God. Every time I stand up here and reject God's word, I 100% believe that He's going to move. And I expect, not, not, not in a demanding way, not, not in like, God, I want this from you, but expect in, is that my function? An expectancy in the fact that, you know what, God? Hands wide open, my heart's open, 
I'm ready to hear. Now we have a sense of expectancy to God who will hear his voice and see him move in amazing ways. Any questions? Is ready? All right, let's pray and ask God to bless our time together. God, I just want to thank you so much for the people in this room and the people who will be coming next week as well. God, oh, I, didn't, I, I said that there's people here who are hungry for you, who want to hear from you. So tonight, and for the next six weeks, have your way. That's all we're asking. Have your way. Move in us. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you turn in your workbooks to chapter 1, that is on page 3, please. Chapter 1, page 3. Here's, here is our first section that we're going to connect with. This week, we're talking about slowing down to connect with God. The big idea tonight is this, that the practice of slowing down will dramatically increase how we connect with God. The, the main point I want you to get from tonight is this, that the practice of slowing down will dramatically increase how we connect with God. In your Bibles, open it up to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Verse 25, verse 237. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan, but I, but I am calling it our foundation. That, that if we want to know why we need to connect with God, why we need to slow down, why we need to do all this, I want to make sure that we get our foundation right. So Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 37, if you don't have a Bible, uh, this, we can listen in. I'm going to start from verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Verse 29. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? The reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too, the Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by the other side. Verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, took care of him. The next day, he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will be for the extra spent you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law replied, The one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. Let's stop there. So, we have an expert in the law trying to make Jesus answer sort of the life foundational question, right? How do I inherit eternal life? Basically, how do I get to heaven? And, and, and Jesus did give him this complex answer. His answer was pretty simple. And I feel that sometimes as Christians, we stray and miss the mark from this. He just simply said, Love the Lord your God. But notice, notice, he did not stop there. Right? He could have said, Alright, 
Love God. Right? Love the Lord. He could have said that as the, as, as, as the answer to this guy's question. But he goes on. He goes this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. That's the core foundation of who we are as Christ followers. But you know, I think sometimes we think, all right, Jesus said to love God and love my neighbor, which that is what it says, but we missed the part where he said about your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Jesus was saying, that part of our relationship with Christ, part of who we are, part of how we connect with God, is everything else, all part of this. What I think, how I treat my body, my strength, my heart, what I feel, my soul. Now this is important, because what happens is when we, in our lives, have Lives that are so busy and so filled up that we cannot slow down to connect with God, we can't honor what Jesus wants us to do. Right? If my mind is so stressed out from work and, 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 and I don't and, and, and I, I'm so engrossed in work and my mind is so focused on my that, I can't do what Jesus asked me to do and love God with all my mind. If I'm running at full speed and I'm working 80 hours a week and I don't sleep well, there's no way I can love Jesus with all my strength. If I'm not spending time in, in solitude, in quietness, in worship to God, there's no way I can love Jesus with all my heart. So let's, we need to strip away all the things that... that Sometimes that we do and strip away all the layers that we put on and go back to the foundation. And the foundation is simple. Jesus gave us a foundation. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul. And I feel that there's so many things in our lives that prevent us from doing this. What I want you to do right now is I want you to uh, just talk about the tables. What I want you to do is, I want you to introduce yourself. Joshua, if you want to go to the table and just activity. I want you to talk to others, introduce yourself, and ask yourself these two questions. Question number one is this. What time does your day start? And that, number one is what time does your day start? And number two, what is the most important thing on your mind when you start your day? Be honest, right? No judgment, no condemnation, all of so, Spend about five minutes. What time does your day start? And what's the most important thing in your mind when you start your day? Go. To give you a different way about thinking about your day. Can I do that? Well, what about Genesis 1? Please. Genesis 1. You don't know where it is? Perfect, you're about it. <laughs> Genesis 1, don't have it.
the night and the day. Up in the evening. The evening <coughs> precedes the day. So, your day starts when you go to bed. And your day starts resting in his presence. Think about that. Now, your day doesn't start at 5. You know, this started at 6. That my day starts when I put my head on the pillow and then it starts. That has radically changed my way when I wake up. When I wake up, before, before I have this mindset, I'll wake up with what I had to do, I'll wake up with things that would distract me, things that would tempt my time. Think, think, things that things that would uh, interrupt, right? Uh, and my mind would not be in a good place, so I, I wouldn't be able to get devotions done. When I look at Genesis and see how the evening proceeds the day, and look at the Jewish tradition, which is your day starts your day and night. So when I go to bed, I am in his presence. And, 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 uh, and sometimes I'm in my bed, and I, I think my wife is a weird sometimes, sometimes I'm in my bed, and I, and I lay down, and I put my hands up. Like I'm stretching, like I'm just surrendering to God to start my day, which starts when I put my head in on my pillow. And, and my day starts resting in His presence and going to sleep. And what I found is that when I go to sleep, knowing that I started my day, my mornings have a radically different. I, I, I'm not tempted with things that walk by my time. The, the, the first thing I want to do is, is go on a prayer walk or, or read my Bible or be in His presence continuously. I want to bend in His presence. Now, I, there's been no words for everyone, but, but I think if we try to develop this mindset, right, that we gradually help us in our spiritual walk. If you're having a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 10. So we were already in Luke 10, verse 25 to 37. We were talking about the foundation. Right? The, the, the teacher asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? We talked about what the foundation was. was love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Okay. Now we're at verse 38. Okay. So we, so we read verses uh, 25 to 37. And now we're continuing in the story of verse 38. And this has a great illustration and picture of sort of our culture today. This is uh, at the home of Mary and Martha. And here's what it says. Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. As Jesus and the disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. Verse 4. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work for myself? Tell her to help me. <coughs> Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You were worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Or indeed, only one Mary has chosen what is better, and it will be not be taken away from her. <laughs> Mary and Martha represent two different approaches to the Christian life. Now, if, if we look, if we look at Martha, right, she's actively doing things. She's actively okay, what she's I don't want you to focus on the actual acts. I want you to focus on the actual heart. Because Jesus was all about the heart. <coughs> now, on the service level, right, if I said, hey, there is this uh, there's Martha, and she wants to get everything right for Jesus. She wants to get the table ready, she wants to get the food together, the plates together, the napkins, right? They make, 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 make the perfect dinner party. Who are one of the people who want to have like, a perfect dinner party and everything all set to it, right? To be honest. Okay. Yeah? 
Hi, wild ladies. She, so she, on the surface level, it's, it's, she, could, she wants to have a home ready for use. But the Bible simply says that she was actively distra distracted by all the preparations she's doing. And because she's distracted with what she has to do, she misses what she must do. And that's be in the presence of Christ. Right? If, if any of you uh, volunteer some time to serve ministry, so now that you can know, right, that just because you serve God, that doesn't mean you're actually with God. Make sense? That, that, that sometimes I can do so much to try to, uh, I don't know, fill the void or what I need. But actually what I do is I need God. Her life is fragmented, pressured, filled with distractions. Her duties become, made her disconnected from Jesus. But can I want you to look at the heart? See, I think that based on, based on this, this whole paragraph, that if Martha was to sit at the feet of Jesus, Probably still be distracted. She probably, she probably, she, she, she probably, oh, you know what? I gotta get that done. I gotta get that done. And, and, and her mind will be distracted. And you can tell she's missing the connection with Jesus because she actually tells Jesus what to do. Right? She, she said, Jesus, tell her to help me. Right? Where, where do you get the nerve to tell Jesus what to do? Right? I, 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 but, and she's probably thinking, right, right, Jesus, you're in my home, and you're, 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 you're my rules, my guests. Tell her, tell her, tell her to come home. Mary is the opposite, right? She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. She's listening to him. She is being with Jesus. Loving him. Being attentive. Being open. Quiet. Engaged in his presence. Right? Mary's not trying to master God. Right? She's not telling him what to do. She's not asking him why so and so is not doing this. Mary's simply just being with Jesus. I think we can flip that. Right? I, I think if Mary was doing the chores, I think she wouldn't be distracted. She wouldn't be uh, uh, but all the preparation, I think she would just be focused on Jesus being the center of her life. On page four, you're going to see two different diagrams. Uh, I love this quote. This is a quote from uh, Bill Heibel. And uh, the quote is this Busyness is the unrivaled arch enemy of spiritual authenticity. Love that. Business, the unrivaled arch enemy of spiritual authenticity. That when we fill our lives with busyness and distractions, like Martha, our authenticity as spiritual beings is not there. And the authenticity is our foundation, right? The Lord God on your heart, on your mind, on your soul. If I miss any part of that, my spiritual life is not authentic or genuine. I'm putting something in its place. Spiritual authenticity freezes the business. Page four. You're going to see this chart here. You're going to see on your chart, page four, you're going to see two different diagrams. We're going to look at the top diagram. This is a diagram from a pastor and queen named Pete Pizarro. He wrote a couple books called Emotionally Healthy Church, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. I had the privilege of sitting under him uh, for a whole day in Queens and, and learning from him. And uh, he's sort of the leader movement in sort of uh, contemplative spirituality in converting the balance. So what I want you to do, your page looks blank, so I want you to fill in the left circle. And I want you to write down uh, contemplation or 
being with God. Right? Contemplation or being with God. That's going to be on the left-hand side of your book on that small left circle there. On the other side, I want you to write um, activity or uh, you can put down doing. The, the, you can put down in the box the word activity and the word doing. Right? So one is contemplation, one is activity, and the other side is being, and the other side is doing. At the bottom, I want you to write down my life or your life. And you should notice, and I want you to draw an arrow or a line that's not straight, like a swiggly arrow line that you see in the bottom of your page. This represents Martha, who we looked at. But you know what? It can also represent me. Or you. Right? That, that in the activity, in the doing, it could be a <coughs> job, stuff I need to do in the garage, in the house, of course, taking my kids from A to Z. Serving in the church. Right? It, it should be a variety of things. Right? This chart, we have the potential to have this. And what happens with our life is it, it's imbalanced and our life is going to go swiggle and sometimes it's out of control. That if our balance is not right, if we're not spending the right time with God, and we're doing more things than being with God, our life will be inbound, and our life will be sort of a swiggly line, not going straight. Second chart. So it should be the bottom of page four as well. Now you see two circles, they're even size. First one, right now that's contemplation, being with God. And the second one, right now, activity, or doing. Same thing with the first, but you notice that the circles are balanced. And the bottom, write down the word your life or my life. And write down a, a straight line, a straight arrow. And, and the point that I want to project is this. That when we have a balanced life of being with God and doing for God, our lives have a balance and it goes on a straight arrow. And I want you to write in the middle of those two uh, Bs the word Christ center. Christ center. Because the reality is that your life is not merely meant to be balanced. Balance is one key component, but the main component is Christ being the center of everything we do. Right? So, the reason we need to have a balance of people who are being with God and doing with God is because we need to have the understanding that we need to operate with Christ at the center of everything we do. So when I go to work and I go to my job, I should operate with Christ being the center. When I'm mowing the lawn with my kids, Christ is at the center. When I have a tragedy or a triumph or a joy, Christ is at the center. And if we don't spend that, if we don't spend that out of the time of being what God is doing, Christ would not be the center of our lives. You know, the truth is, and this is the great truth of humanity, that God made each one of us different, right? Just, I mean, outwardly, right, we're a little more different. You know, inwardly, we're different too. We all function differently, right? Some of us need five hours of sleep, some of us need ten hours of sleep, right? Some of us are morning people, some of us are evening people. Some of us are introverts, some of us are extroverts. And so we, we have different giftings and different ways we process this. Now, 
the Bible doesn't give us a blueprint, right? Exactly in minutes of time how long we need to be with God. You know what I'm right? So, I guess it would, I guess it would be easy, right? If, if, it said, if the Bible said, hey, uh, as humans, you need to spend uh, two hours per day with God and you're going to uh, fulfill your duties as a Christian. Right? I guess you could say that, but you know what? It wouldn't be authentic. Right? But that wouldn't be a real relationship. Right? I can, can you imagine if I told my wife, all right, uh, Melinda, you can only uh, be with me, you have to be with me at four hours per day, and that's going to prove your love to me. Right? It all depends. And the reality is, you know how you're wired, you know how what fills you, refreshes you, and for some of us, it may be 15 minutes a day that will help us connect with God. For some of us, it may be an hour, an hour and a half. For some of us, it may be morning and night. For some of us, it may be every day. For some of us, it may be every other day. But the reality is, right, that a good way to discover how much time we need with God, and here's a good rule of thumb. A good rule of thumb on how we discover our time with God is to see how we how attentive we are in, to God in the everyday. Okay. So a good rule of thumb is how attentive are you to hearing God in your daily life and to see God. In life? If you can see God move and hear from God in your day, when you go throughout your day, I think that's a good rule of thumb. But if you don't, maybe you need to do other things. And hopefully we'll be able to touch on this more for the next few weeks. Is, but sometimes, I'll, I'll, I will be honest right now, sometimes we're doing the wrong things. Right? Some of us are just doing the wrong things. Right? Because for some of us, right, uh, we're, we, you know, someone tells us how they connect with God, and we try to do it, and it may not work for us, right? Maybe, you know, I remember, um, uh, I remember a different one of my white people have tried to help me, and somebody said, oh, you know, to have a daily devotion, you need to read uh, the daily bread. If you don't know what the daily bread is, it's a little kind of devotional. Read the daily bread, read it once a day, and, you, and you're good. Honestly, I didn't know. Right? And, but if I, keep, if, I, if I keep reading that, and there's nothing for me, you know what? Else. And for some of us, your connection and your connection to breakthrough in your life, connection to, to God in your life, is not happening because you're just not doing the right things and because you're not your personality and you can get with God in a different way. So, a good way to discover if we're doing enough time being with God is to be authentic. So, for example, right, you get in an argument with somebody. And, and, and if your first reactions are, are, are anger and human reaction and, just, and you just go into whole distress, right? maybe you're not seeing how God may use you in that situation. But maybe you get an argument and, and the right thing to do is say, God, right, how do you want me to address that? Let's be attentive to God using you. Or let's say you drive on the throughway. And, 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 and you see an accident that just happened, and, and you're sitting in traffic, right? And the traffic's backed up, and you're cursing, you're not cursing, but maybe, maybe you're upset that there's traffic on the way home because of an accident. <clears throat> but, but you know what? If you were attentive to God, what you would say is, God, thank you for making me stay at work five minutes longer because I you probably saved my life. Or, or, or thank you for, for me missing that because you preserved. Right? Or, or, or you have a decision you need to make in your life, and you don't know what to do, right? But if we're attentive to who God is in our lives, right, we can hear God. See, when we have sufficient slowing down time alone with God, you'll find that your activity is marked with a deep, loving communion with God. And when we have a deep, loving communion with God, his love flows through us. And I really feel that sometimes we miss the point when Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength. 
straight, and then it's a period. Stop. Then, of the neighbor. That if I'm being with God, that I'm attentive to God, the overflow of His love is going to come through me. That I, I, I know that if I'm being, if I'm, I know if I'm spending enough time with God, how I react. Right? Well, when my kids do something wrong, if I, how I act to them, if I act out in fatherly love or human anger, I know whether I need to be more connected with God or not. Let me tell you a quick story. And I think this is actually slowing down. Um, if you can, uh, open your Bible to Matthew 11, and now I'll tell the story. If you're in your workbook, page 5 in your workbook. Matthew 11. service, 
and I'm setting up a board meeting once a month that lasts two hours. So like, it, it, it just a uh, constant grind, 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 grind. Uh, this, this is life, right? I figured, this is life, right? This is, this is, this is, this is the plot I have in life. This is what I am sort of dealt with. Well, um, I was, you know, every day I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm drinking, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't drink, uh, when I think of Starbucks, I, we're not, I don't like coffee, but I drink like espresso drink. With espresso, give it a little espresso in. So, uh, on the, uh, so on a normal day, I'll have anywhere from about like six to eight espresso shots per day, right, in my drink. So, like, I'm just, per day, I'm just like, caffeine, yeah, I'm kind of caffeine. So, like, when I get to Starbucks in the morning, I, I drink a cup of coffee, my break, I drink a cup of coffee, one break, a cup of coffee, and then on the way home, a cup of coffee, right? So, I'm just water caffeine, trying to push my way through, trying to grow this church, trying, trying, trying to do it, trying to grasp my family, and, and do all this. We, my wife got pregnant uh, with our second one, and while she was going through um, her, while, 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 while we got she was pregnant, we also, just my wife was just, had issues with the church and just my time, and uh, would bolt my eyes up as a senior pastor of this church, and my wife asked to go to another church. So my wife says, Tim, I want to go to another church. I'm not being fed. This is not good for us. Um, I want to go somewhere else. Why you're so fast? I was like, and, and, I, and sometimes, you know, she would, you know, she would go to her mom, who was an hour away for the weekend, and, and go there, and just anything to sort of avoid. And you know, also, it, 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 there's also some other unhealthy elements that was that was at the church that that, that didn't feed, you know. So we had to sit down at the table, and as she was pregnant with our second one. We ask ourselves, uh, is this how we want to raise a second one? Do we want to bring uh, a second child into this mix? And the reality is, no. It was hard because going through Seminary. I had a I had a track on how I was going to go through my career, right? And I, and I had a date or a time frame when I wanted to pastor my own church, and I beat it by like three or four years. The church was giving us free housing, nice four bedroom house for us to be in, rent free, part of my payment. And as I sat down and asked God what he was doing in my life, it was back to, you know, do I actually love him with all my heart and mind and soul? No. I wasn't there. I was doing too much. Because I wasn't there with him, I couldn't give my wife what she needs. I couldn't give my family the attention that I need. I had no control relationship. I had no margin whatsoever. So we made a decision to leave the church for me to just get a job in the business world. And then leave the house and everything. And we named our um, second child Elizabeth, which means grace. Because we feel that it was the grace of God that gave her to us to show us that we needed to be with Him more. Sorry. I'm... What I found leaving that situation, when I had a more balanced time in my life, I realized how unhealthy my relationship with God was. Right? I realized how much I was neglecting a time. I also realized how bad I was as a husband, and how bad I was as a father. And now I had no room for friends in my life. And I had nothing to give other people. I had no energy to serve God. So it wasn't until I got out of the situation 
that I realized, hey, man, time out. I gotta slow down. I gotta cut back on everything. Because the most important thing in my life is Jesus Christ, my wife, my kids, everything else comes last. My career goals, my ministry goals. And over the past four years, right, God has tremendously blessed my life, my spiritual journey, my relationship with my wife, my ministry. Right? I have been able to have so much of an impact, not only here at Grace Fellowship, but I get to preach in other churches around the region, right? than I ever would have had if I didn't believe. All this being said is, as we go through these six weeks, I'm usually not emotional, right? <laughs> as we go through these six weeks, okay, this is something that not only did I just read a book, right? This is stuff that I was. This is stuff that I, I, I journeyed with God and I struggled with, and I want us to be on a journey together. So, Matthew 11, if you're already there. But we're going to close with this. Matthew 11, verse 20 to 30. This is the word of Jesus. Here's what it says. Verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Focus on the first verse. Come to me, all you who are weary, all you who are burdened, and I will give you rest. The word of Jesus in this passage gives us a totally countercultural view on how we need to live our life. Earlier in this class, I showed you pictures, right, to illustrate your life being chaotic, being overloaded. At some point, maybe you have felt this way. Maybe, just maybe, you feel this way tonight. Maybe you feel that you can identify with being too stressed to function. But think about the word of Jesus here in verse 28. It's simple. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened. Come to me. Jesus wants you to come to you with your burdens, your stresses, your pains, your struggles. But you know what? The culture that we live in Actually, teachers have done enough to do that. You can realize that the culture that we live in says that when we're tired or we're stressed or we have burdens or we're weary, there are so many other things that can fill our lives. Turn the TV on. Enjoy a good TV show. Tune your brain out. Get on social media. Right? Stop people on Facebook and Twitter. Right? See, see what's going on in people's lives. Watch a movie. Drink. Right? Fill your body up with, with alcohol and beer that you need to waste your pains away. Drugs. Shopping. Right? I, I, I'm going to do a bad time. What do I do? I go to the mall. You shop. Right? Some people just do that. But that's what you do. Or, or eating. Right? Eat. So in you just eat our pain away. Or, or simply, I'm just going to sleep and, and, and not eat with it. Or I'm just going to neglect it. See, our culture says that the best way to deal with your problems, the best way to deal with your stress, is to fill it up with something in your life. And to take you honest, those things do provide temporary relief. Right? They do. Right? I, 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 I eat this big chocolate cake and wow, right? That provides relief to my soul. Moment, right? And then that's part of it for my soul long term. 
nor my physical health, right? Or, right, if I, if I, you know, go shopping and I buy stuff that, that, that material thing that, that, just, that just pleases me, right? If I buy a new toy or something, you know, a new gadget, that may mask my problems. But the reality is, it doesn't solve the heart of the issue. Remember Mary and Martha, the whole issue is the heart. Not exactly what they're doing, but actually the heart of, of how they were operating. And I love Matthew 11 because Jesus gives us the blueprint on how we can live in this culture. The rest of this verse 7 is verse 28. Right? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Wow. He'll give us rest. How crazy is that? Not only does he say, Tim, come to me with your burden, come to me with who you are, come to me with your problems, but you know what? After you lay everything down on me, I'm going to give you rest. Well, right? For me, hey, that's like a one-sided deal. Like, I, I'm getting, like, I, I'm, Jesus, I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you my burdens, my stresses, everything about me, everything that's plaguing me, I'm giving it to you. And you're going to give me rest? You, you, you thought it was the, for the right thing, right? That, that the, the Savior that we serve, that, that died on the cross for our sin, not only, not only died to take the sin away from you, but he said, I'm going to take away everything that's you. How many of us that our first instinct is that we go in? For a lot of us, for, for a lot of us, the, the first thing we want to try to try to solve the issue ourselves, or we want to mask the issue ourselves. But the reality is, Jesus says, it is simple. You come to me, and I will give you rest. The big question: Do we actually do we actually believe this? Sometimes we read we read it like, wow, uh, this is a little too good to be true, Jesus. This is a little too good to be true that, 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 that you will give you rest from all this. See, it's one thing to read this and believe this in our head. It's another thing to believe this in our heart and with it out. This is points on later in the, in the verse, right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from you. Not only did he die on the cross from our sins, but Jesus modeled how we can live our lives on earth. He modeled how to pray. He modeled how to minister. He modeled how to heal. He modeled how to be used by the Holy Spirit. He, he, he said, I will give you rest. So when you, when you give everything to me, I'll give you rest. And I want you to learn from me. Jesus modeled how to be connected to the Father. You look through all Jesus' life. Think about this, okay? You're given this mission. It's basically save the world, right? They have the mission to, to, to save mankind, to do what you can, to push the gospel, and grow the and start to grow the church. And that, that is your mission, if you're Jesus. And you have three years. Three years. If, if you gave me a, a task and, and I only have three years, I'd be grinding some time. My, my human interest is to go, go, go. But look at read the gospels from the end of the end, one of Matthew or Mark or John. Notice how many times Jesus is not influenced by the crowd. He's not influenced by people, what they have to say. It's all about being connected with God, connecting with the Father, and doing the Father's work. And Jesus has a great understanding and balance on how to do this. He says, come to me, all you are weary, and learn from me. Here's what you're doing this week. 
Every week, I'm going to give you an assignment. And I really hope that you do these assignments. Um, there is, there are for your, they will help enhance uh, this class for you. And they will help um, enhance your growth. So on page five, I want you to do the reflective questions. Answer them on your own time this week. I, it, it, if you can, write them on a paper in your workbook. Write them out. First question is, uh, are you fully able to look down all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? And the next question is, what is the from fully over God as you were intended to? And every week I'm going to have you do an immediate action step. And this week, your immediate action step this week is this. Think of something you will do this week that will allow you to slow down to connect with God. Next session, you're going to have the opportunity to share what you did differently to help you connect with God. So those are the two things that I want us to do this week. What I'm going to do is I want to end the time of prayer. So um, this asking God to uh, minister to us. So if we can, uh, don't ask us just to uh, close our eyes, bow our head, whatever you need to do. And, as we kind of close up our time. And, and here's what I um, want to do. As we're thanking God, um, I want us to think that any of us need Jesus to take that burden away from us. Take any special ones. And so let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for this time. And we want to thank you for um, ministering to us tonight. Thank you for what you have already done. And thank you for what you will do over the next few weeks. Jesus, you tell us that your burden is light. And when we come to you, you give us rest. So our feeling, Lord, is that, that there are people in this room tonight that have burdens, weariness, stresses, things that are plaguing them from connecting with. As we hear your voice, God, uh, I just want to ask that anyone here who needs uh, you to give them rest, who need to bring things to you, I just want uh, everyone to just go over and deal with that, just raise your hand as we pray. So I can just pray for you, everyone. If, if you feel so that you need to have life up with an easy yoke, and that you just need Christ to take away any weariness, any burdens, any stresses, any pressures, and anything that, that is plaguing you from going on by your heart, mind, so I just want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. God, I want to pray for those who have raised their hand, Lord. I want to pray for those, whatever they're dealing with, whatever stresses they're dealing with, Lord. I pray that they, that they, whatever they're dealing with, they take it and they leave it at the foot of your cross tonight. Jesus, you are. I picture, Jesus, that you have your arms wide open right now. And I picture your arms wide open. And all you want us to do is to come to you with what we're dealing with right now. So all the hands are raised. Uh, all people who raise their hands. We come to you. We come to you with faith that you are going to do what you say and give us rest. Jesus, we want to thank you.